Hello, my name is John Grant. I'm a co-organiser of the Festival of Maintenance. Today I'm in Liverpool and I'm delighted to be joined by Adrian McEwen. Hello. Great to see you. Likewise. Now, I've wanted to talk to you for a while um, and it's in relation to a tweet that you posted. Oh no, you found me out. Yeah, oh. and it's um, your time at STNC. Mm -hmm. Which is going back a while. So yeah, I, I think that's about ninety-eight. Yeah, it was. I joined. So that was my second job out of university, um, and I joined them in ninety-six. It was, and then um, a couple of years after that, it was in ninety-nine. We got acquired by Microsoft, uh, and then I had. Yeah, I was at Microsoft for a couple of years till I think it started two thousand and two um, when I left Microsoft. So the STNC, yes, hitchhiker mm. framework. Yeah, that's what you were working on at the time. So what's that, what was that about? So so what STNC did was um, kind of network software for embedded devices, low end devices. Uh, when I first joined, that was um, PDAs back when personal digital assistants yeah. were the future. Uh, most people watching this will not have any clue what one of those is. Uh, because at about that sort of time is also when uh, GSM came in and so we started to get digital mobile phones and it became fairly quickly apparent that these two things were not going to be two separate devices but were going to merge together and we'd have a single device and so basically what we did was we did internet software for mobile phones um, when really most people, you know, being able to send text messages was an advanced feature on my first mobile phone. Not all mobile phones had that. Um, so we were then kind of going, okay, let's put a web browser into this. Uh, so the kind of birth of the mobile internet, I guess. So what I'd like to do is play, if it's okay with you, mm -hmm. a kind of alternate history. Right. Because, you know, it's, a generation ago, we're talking about that. 20, <laughs> 22, 23 I, I years ago. I have to grave it to my moustache to, to prove it, yeah. Uh, so, in 93, the Mosaic browser came, um, came on the scene. And actually, this is, I think this is uh, relevant, that it's the 30th anniversary this year of the invention of the web. So, 1989. Tim Berners-Lee and his colleagues in the uh, Nuclear Research mm -hmm. Organization came up with uh, HTTP, the protocol, and then that led to HTML, the hypertext, and they decided to put that into the public domain yeah. for the be benefit of everybody. But it wasn't until um, user-friendly uh, graphical interfaces came about and really the leader was Mosaic, but then Mark Andreessen and his colleagues then set up Netscape. Yeah. And they launched Netscape Communicate. Mm -hmm. Microsoft at the time, they were busy with Visual Basic, Visual Basic 6. Yeah. It was launched, uh, I think, 98. Yeah, that's it. I remember, you know, because that was as that was starting to come in was when I was at university doing my computer science degree. So I remember using Gopher, which was one of the things that kind of predated all of this stuff. And then the excitement when suddenly the university computers had this thing called Mosaic on it. Yeah. And it was a bit like Gopher, but you could get pictures in it as well. And it was just a much nicer, richer experience. And then some of the machines had this Netscape Navigator program on it as well. Uh, which and if you could get one of the, onto one of those computers, because that like shows you the images whilst they were downloading, whereas like Mosaic would wait until it finished downloading everything and then show you the picture. You've got a um, memory, yes. Whereas like Netscape would be like, okay, I've got the I've got the HTML and like I'm going to be downloading these images, and you know they took some time back in those days because even on a internet, you know, super Janet university network, stuff would still take time to download. Um, and you'd get them and the page would start to kind of flesh itself out. But that was the kind of key, to me at least it seems, kind of usable innovation that Netscape Navigator brought along over Mosaic. 
because you got to see this stuff whilst it was loading and given the time that things took to load having less time staring at a blank screen <laughs> was like so a it, useful feature it gave you feedback yeah and it was like, it's kind of a package that put together FTP HTTP HTTPS yep. and GoFund and all the other mm. protocols so that was 94 93 and then Microsoft launched Internet Explorer yep. which was the start of then the browser wars mm -hmm. now we all know what happened I'm not, I'm not going to get involved with the yeah. antitrust and business but what I would like to focus on is there was a period then of about four or five years where browser technology was really owned by commercial companies there was Netscape and there was Microsoft yeah it wasn't open it wasn't open source no I mean the standards were but there were people like, because the HTML standard, as you say, That's Tim Berners-Lee had yeah. released that as, as an open, that was uh, an RFC, was it? No, it wasn't an RFC, that was W3C standards, weren't they? And so there was HTML2, kind of what that added into it, and then HTML3 and 3.2. Um, well, I'm going to come on to that, okay. about the, the standards, but you're right, the, 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 the specifications were developed in the open, they sort of lagged a bit behind, so that yeah, the browsers would kind of add new. Like I think Netscape were responsible for the blink tag. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then they'd add tables and things like that. That was like a revolutionary thing. But I think yeah, the two browsers would kind of try to one up each other on features, and then a bit later the standard would come out, which would go, oh yeah, this thing that so and so you know, that Netscape added, and these things that IE Internet Explorer added. Now we've kind of written them down as. As like this is now HTML three because it's taken all those things that they added as cool features to try and as you were saying like the competition and things and yeah. then kind of doing proprietary extensions and then they'd sort of release them so it's kind of like we get this first and people will hopefully use our browser because it's got the latest cool things in it and then eventually the other people will get it because they'll start to standardise on it. But at that time, the core, the the the, the there's a few names for it. It's either the browser engine mm -hmm. or the uh, layout engine. Yeah. Those were actually proprietary products that yeah. weren't open. So once Microsoft won, kind mm -hmm. of, we yeah. had to accept that, Netscape had a change of mind and they founded the Mozilla Foundation yeah. and they open sourced the browser engine. Yeah. And things changed from that. Also at the same time, innovation doesn't stop, so we had uh, JavaScript came on, which mm -hmm. was kind of spec'd out in 10 days, I believe. We also had Java applets, which yep. we don't see anymore. No. The following year, um, 96 now, Flash, right. Macromedia Flash yeah. came around, uh -huh. which allowed people to uh, look at game development. Yep. Uh, rich internet applications mm -hmm. and it also had its own layer of uh, platform or programmable interface yeah. its own language I guess maybe arguably was the kind of competitor to the Java applets almost and kind of won out probably it was yeah it wasn't anywhere near as heavyweight as Java could be but was solving a lot of the similar problems probably within putting having a, a section of the browser that you can kind of fully control and do some stuff in, it in a platform independent way. Yeah, it provided flexibility. Yeah. What the browsers couldn't do. Remember, they were still quite primitive in terms mm -hmm. of what they are today. Yeah. But it was still proprietary. Yeah. It wasn't oh, a yeah, yeah. source. Uh, so, although we could probably argue now that Flash was a kind of distraction, it's, it's go, going away. Yeah. And it also opened up a lot of vulnerabilities, um, lots of bugs, but it did give us things like YouTube. Yeah. YouTube was actually a flash uh, in 2005. So going back to what you were talking about standards, we had HTML4 was in 97. Right. And then it wasn't until 2014 so a 17 year hiatus before we got HTML5. Yeah, did we have, there was probably, because XHTML kind of slots in somewhere around there, which we ended up being a bit of a, a dead end, I think, and I can't fully remember what the difference was between that 
and HTML4. Yeah. But I have a feeling that kind of XHTML was kind of a, the, well, at the time maybe was seen as kind of the next step, ended up being a bit of a dead end. And then eventually we get HTML5, but as you say, many years later. Uh, 17 years. Yeah. So what I'm starting to think is that the, that, that five year period when the browser engines were proprietary, mm -hmm. prior to Netscape opening up the software as open source, yeah. that actually caused much more uh, delay or distraction or dead ends that would travel down, say, with other proprietary technology. And I think what made a difference was in 2008, where Google released Chrome. Mm -hmm. Open source, so yeah. they had the Chromium project, but they also had their own uh, commercial browser yeah. as well. But because it was open source, the following year we got Node.js, which was essentially taking the V8 JavaScript engine right. and putting that in a runtime environment mm -hmm. so JavaScript would run on the server. Yeah. It, it was done before by Netscape, but this time it gained traction. Yeah. So Node has become quite a you know, it figures a lot in yeah. In, I mean, in IT, I said yeah, yeah. Node.js, Python, and Ruby, probably the three dominant scripting languages for server side stuff these days. Like maybe these days we're getting more like Go and Rust and the there, others. There's quite a few. It's, it's getting much more. There is popular. Yeah, but. you've identified quite a few there, but it didn't stop with Node. We also got Electron mm -hmm. more recently, yeah. so that's allowed. The standards that were started in 1989 to be used for web uh, desktop development yeah. in addition to the web. So Visual Studio Code mm -hmm. is built on Electron. Slack, I believe, is... Uh, Slack's desktop app is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So what I'm trying to say is, or get to a point, is to see that once the browser engines were open source and then driven a bit more because Google wants the web to win. Yeah. So by releasing Chrome, what they were doing is forcing innovation on the rest of the industry to speed up uh, browser development. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about alternate histories there. Yeah. How much different do you think things could have been if Netscape actually open sourced in the first place? In the first place, that's interesting because because if I remember rightly, Mosaic is open source, wasn't it? Was that it was NCS NCSA Mosaic, wasn't it? I'm to, actually, no, there was a because the IE was based on Spyglass Mosaic, wasn't it? So yeah, maybe Mosaic wasn't. Maybe that was always closed source as well. Um, and how I don't yeah it's hard to tell I mean I suppose partly because it's not turning history isn't it but also there are many overlapping factors in some ways because open source as a thing back in the late 90s was much less you know I remember being part of a startup to begin with and then part of Microsoft and just this idea of taking any open source software was like a no don't touch any of that because that will taint our proprietary stuff and then the lawyers will get involved and we'll have to open up all of our proprietary things and then we'll lose all our livelihoods kind of you know was the a very simplified view of the, of the mindset um, and then over time you get things like you know, Apache as the open source web server becoming completely dominant um, compared to uh, internet information services like oh, yes. IS the um, Microsoft equivalent and so some of it is just the evolution of open source as a thing that you can do and that will, will let you share some stuff. I guess some of it is also the internet seeping into more things and people getting more used to that kind of sharing things rather than, you know, I remember like before I was at uni, I ran a public domain company with a couple of mates where we would advertise, you know, people would send us letters with postal orders in um, in order to get some shareware or open source, as we'd call it these days, software, public domain software, and we'd send them floppy disks back because we didn't have that instantaneous 
network kind of transmission mechanism. Well, um, if I give you an example, yeah, because this occurred to me on only the other day when I was thinking about having a talk with you is that in 2006, well, I've had to write these down by the way, <laughs> um, a chap called John Resnick, Resnick, I think, sorry if I've got that wrong, he open sourced, it was essentially a library of reusable utilities, right? but they, it was a kind of coherent uh, library called mm -hmm. jQuery. Right. Now, what I was what I was most impressed with that is how he didn't stop there. He thought, okay, I've released a really useful piece of software that really did gain traction. Mm. And it, it, what he was able to do is pull together the document object model, yeah, CSS, and provide a kind of event driven programming paradigm, yeah, which then integrated with AJAX. So it kind of really did change the landscape, which the browser vendors hadn't done to that point. Well, because they're all competing almost on like JavaScript is a standard, um, or ECMAScript that it's kind of based on whatever is a standard, but you always end up with these little kind of browser quirks, don't you? Which is one of the, the things that slowly played out over the time. I mean, I remember when we were at STNC, because we were developing, you know, HTML 3.2, GIF, JPEG, browser for a mobile phone, which was the equivalent feature set that um, minus dark JavaScript, but in 2000, sorry, in 1997, JavaScript wasn't really that important. It mostly did a little bit of form validation for you um, and not much else. So, and we were slowly adding scripting in, but yeah, it wasn't a big important feature. So we had, but we had the same features that the desktop Netscape Navigator and Insect Explorer had. And, but the problem is that you read the standard. And so we were implementing the standard, you know, the specs there, it's published, I can read it and it can say, this is the H1 tag, this is what it means, this is what you should do. Um, and there are all these weird edge cases that you don't realize until you start to write an HTML parser, where you need to cope with this text file that has arrived that supposedly is HTML um, and conforms to the spec. Only, like it mostly conforms to the spec. And then there'll be a bit where somebody's forgotten to do a closed table tag and they've just carried on with their other stuff. And as long as when you load it in Netscape, it looks okay, the person writing that page doesn't realize any better or there's nothing to catch them on it and go like, that's wrong, you need to put a slash table for that to work. And so we actually ended up with you know, our, our infrastructure because we weren't a dominant player. We were building a small, you know, we were a little tiny company of like 40 odd people or so, 40 or 50 people when we got acquired by Microsoft. Um, like we couldn't set the standards, we were always following other people. And so we'd implement stuff to the spec, but there'd be just like holes or edge cases in the spec. And then we were down to like, well, so we, we would like have some stuff where it's like, this is what we think it should be. And then we'd actually have another layer of um, kind of auto correct, of sort of corrections, which is like, whose bug are we going to copy? Like in this scenario, are we going to do what Netscape does? Or are we going to do what IE does? <laughs> because our, the people giving us the stuff we need to display are going to have picked one of those models. <laughs> So we're almost implementing the bugs that are in Netscape or something in order to get the web page to look like people want it to look like. Well, it's interesting because that's the point I was trying to come to is that the idea of what jQuery did for maintenance of the web. Mm. And it's the point you just went straight to, the kind of, it enabled cross-browser compatibility yeah. or developers to target one programming API yeah. in order to get the consistent and, and cope with the fact that jQuery is kind of managing all those inconsistencies and going like, oh, in this one, we need to find out whether this bit of the DOM exists and we can call that, or we're running on IE, so we need to call this API instead. And yeah, takes all that away, abstracts it out so that people building the platform have got a stable, like, I know I can just build stuff on this and it'll look okay. So it, it, it was an open source project yeah. that fixed 
browser issues. Yes. Yeah. The, the irony, I think, but the Netscape, Microsoft, still closed source, suddenly comes along, open source the project, and accelerates the development of the web. Yeah. I, I do believe jQuery did change things quite mm -hmm. a bit and made testing and uh, development and maintenance easier. Yeah. But the, the other point I was going to mention before is what I liked about the John Resnick's thinking at the time. Although he released a fantastic tool, a framework, yeah. whether it's a framework or a utility, there's yeah. people, the purists will argue with me, but if we stick with a, a useful framework, he also uh, released at the same time detailed user documentation. And he was mindful at the time that some engineers would kind of skip on that and just focus on the code mm. itself, thought that's what. But not only the documentation he thought was important, the first person he hired or brought into the core development team right. was somebody to focus on the community, mm -hmm. not the software. Right. So he, it was a tool that unified the differences between inconsistencies in CSS, yep. and HTML, and browser differences. He saw the importance of documentation but he also saw the importance of community. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we agree on that, that actually HTML rendering engines, the core part of the browser, was yeah. open source in the first place. It could have been like jQuery. It could have been, and instead of being distracted and going down dead ends, we could have actually moved much further with web development, yeah, less, uh, less of technical debt of companies and yeah. organisations. That's interesting. I'm not sure I do completely I agree with you on that because I think there's a there's a risk, I suppose, to balance it to some extent in ending up with a kind of a monoculture, and then you don't get so much innovation things because you need like the the two things, and I don't know quite what the right ways are to be doing that. But think, I mean, the browser seems to get better at it, like in the. But think of the Linux kernel. Yeah. That's worked, hasn't it? As a, an open source. Yeah. Kernel. It's not backed by any. Um, it's backed by a foundation. Yeah. Well, that's interesting that. You know, it does tie in what we're trying to talk about in maintenance. I think. So let's look forward. Right. So, I'm interested in uh, conversational UI, mm -hmm. user interfaces, the experience you've had. 20 odd years ago. Um, and that includes in conversation with UI. I'm, I'm thinking about Alexa, Google right. Home, and the uh, Microsoft Cortana. Yeah. And there's a few others out there as well. But can you see the, the similarity? We've got the same situation that we had with proprietary browsers mm -hmm. back at the start of the web. It's um, artificial scarcity right. and rather than open source the core and the model of NLP and the bits and pieces that are needed to implement uh, chatbots mm -hmm. and conversation UI yeah. it's still proprietary software now this is the bit where I'm starting to see you know, playing with ideas or what could be yeah. if we go down the route of really open, you know, um, Google open source TensorFlow mm -hmm. quite recently yeah. and that's exploded. Yeah. But the world got together to map the genome you know, once mm -hmm. everybody started to work together and they did it. Yeah. We're also heading into a, um, sadly, a world of an aging population which does mean, unfortunately, um, loneliness is going to feature in a lot of people's lives, which can lead to depression. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to be a controversial thing to say, and it may not appeal to everybody, but say the section of society that it would work yeah. is a kind of digital companion, right. which could help with mental health, um, you know, really what we want is humans to talk to, mm -hmm. but in the absence of that, to be practical, maybe it has to be a machine. Now, if we are, the scenario that I painted earlier where we were held back, say, for 
17 years right. while the browser wars uh -huh. sorted themselves out and eventually Google came on board and open sourced everything. I wonder if we're going to see history repeat itself with conversation and UI and... Uh, yeah, interesting. I, I suppose there's, I don't know, lots to unpack there and a couple of, couple of like two things I suppose that um, I'll try to remember what both of them are rather than tell you one of them and then suddenly realise that I've forgotten what the other point was. But um, one, I think the open sourcing of stuff makes lots of sense because I, th I think it's moving away and maybe ties into some of the model with with maker spaces and co-working space and more collaborative kind of ways of working and things is that it used to be that you would need or the kind of the, the s traditional narrative is that you have like an R&D department that invents new things and then they kind of then slowly gets commercialized and obviously the company needs to fund the R&D department to have this sort of stuff come through. And I think what the open source model is showing us is that it's kind of just scattering and exploding that R&D department almost, where the next wave of new ways of doing stuff could totally come from an R&D department, like they still exist, there's still things, there are still people thinking about new stuff and working with new things, but the fact that in makerspaces and what have you, people can be experimenting with this stuff and following what they're interested in you suddenly open up the number of people who could happen upon that innovation from being just like, oh, there's an X percentage of the population working in R&D labs and they're the only people who can come up with the new thing. Yeah. Whereas suddenly <laughs> they're like, well, actually, there's a much greater percentage of the population now doing stuff that could come up because some of it is more of a numbers game. I think we've seen that a number of times through the development in software and the internet and things, like the, all of the kind of social web sort of stuff actually, you know, in my opinion, came out of the fact that we'd had the dot-com bust in the early 2000s. And basically, there were suddenly loads of computer geeks, people who could write code, could build apps, you know, professionals who were suddenly redundant and had time on their hands, um, and ended up then just going and scratching their own itches and building blogging and what have you and coming up with some stuff. And then the kind of commercialization of it comes later but it actually comes out of a whole bunch of geeks who've got the ability to do, to build their own tools, going, what's useful for us? And they're, they're freed from that like, oh, it needs to be something that I can get past my boss or that the company has to make money from, because to begin with, it's just, I'm just gonna build this because I've got the spare time and, and the capacity and I'm just gonna do it. Uh, and so the open source kind of side of things fits well with that in that you open up a, to a load more people um, who could do R&D, who aren't necessarily. Um, and then the other thing I was going to just touch upon, like I'm not sure that I agree with the, like everyone's, uh, obviously I think we've got an Asian population. And at the moment we do have kind of increasing individualization uh, of society. Um, and I suppose I'm more in the, like, yes, one way we can solve that is to give everybody their own robot to talk to. Um, and the other way, I suppose, partly also as a last resort. In, indeed, and I know that I'm, you know, you're not kind of going. This is what we should look forward to, and, and like join me in kind of just yes. not talking to any other people. Then, but from having been a person who's kind of co-founded does Liverpool and makerspace and co-working space and community, basically, um, yeah, we joke about the fact that um, like Mike keeps just bringing sweets in. And so there's just always a jar that gets replenished every Thursday when Mike's in with loads of sweets that are bad for us. And we're just joking that he's trying to get make sure that everybody else gets type 2 diabetes the same time that he does. Um, and then it's like, well, then, yeah, because of course what we're going to do is we're just going to end up building the first old people's home with a makerspace. Um, so we'll all just still do the same things we always have done. We'll just have, you know, robot beds that can move us around to the laser cutter so we can still just play around with things. Um, because that's what we do and that's how you know we take a space and then we fill it with stuff that's useful or interesting to us so why wouldn't we do that once we're old um, so I suppose I'm seeing that like we'll still just do well, there's, there's a, that's, a, that's an alternate future for you where there, I'm sure there'll be like telepresence robots and digital assistants and all that kind of stuff as well but there'll be a whole bunch of people just kind of hanging out together because we'll all be retired then maybe if we can got pensions but you know that's a different 
<laughs> if I if I understand you then, because I think we're saying the same thing here. Uh, possibly. From a society point of view, yeah, you know, social cohesion, um, but also from a maintenance point of view, mm -hmm. because the world's get becoming more complex. Yeah, that's the default. Um, that the actual thing that's common that will help us cope with that is community. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, also, because you get to see the entropy kind of up close and personal from interacting with other people and realizing that the space just slowly accumulates stuff. <laughs> you have to bring that in. And so there's an ongoing maintenance thing, just it gets it a bit more. And an open source really is the global community. Yeah. People could step in, step out anytime yeah. they want. And I think you hinted at it before the more eyeballs, the more people that have an opinion or challenge the assumptions of what's being proposed, yeah. the better. So more voices is always better. Alexa should be open source then. <laughs> yeah, that lets us run it locally as well, so we don't have to send all the data to Amazon or Google or whoever. Um, let me run it on my machine locally and do the processing locally, or, you know, and there's a well, whole different models you can then spin out as well. You know, um, I'm not a specialist in healthcare or anything, I'm an expert nowhere near, but all I'm thinking is that if the software was available, like TensorFlow, mm -hmm. then universities, research organizations, commercial startups, can then start to play and see how, how far they can stretch what's already there. But going back to this, what I mentioned earlier about depression and mm -hmm. loneliness yeah. and how we're going to turn, I, I think it's a serious problem. Uh, and, and, and you do, yeah, yeah. no, you don't disagree. But the, it could be that, you know, an outfit somewhere in some part of the world can actually create a, a machine learning model that can start to sense a change in somebody's voice. So we already have sen sentiment analysis. Yeah. But this I'm talking about a person actually speaking to a machine. Mm -hmm. And it can actually sense that actually this person is starting to fall over into a crisis. And rather than let that be, it can send signals for actual a real practitioner to step in. A human steps in and takes over. Yeah, so there's lots of I don't know. I'm I'm really conflicted on those. I can see those things happen. You know, I can and I can see the intent behind them. But I think there's a there's a whole load of infrastructure you need to build around. I suppose oh, yes. the the risky thing to me it feels that <laughs> the technologists because they always are like, look, there's this cool new bit of software I can build a thing and it can do it. And what we also need to get is that kind of critical critical perspective on what we're doing and, and working out ways of like, yes, you, you could build something like that. And there are definitely scenarios where you can say, yeah, that's an amazing thing. That's really good for the world. And then there are other times when you kind of go, but who's, who has the power in that relationship and who is it you're going to, and you get it already played out with I like can... having a trigger alarm as you, when you've fallen over as an old person and suddenly be, oh, you, you know, like, as, I guess also I'm like, we should be building, looking to it because at some point we're going to be needing that tech. And so we should be building stuff that we're going to be happy with what it does rather than it being like, oh, I suddenly I need to go, make sure I need to go in and turn the kettle on every morning because otherwise a whole army of like the NHS or my kids or whoever, my health insurance provider or you know suddenly swings into action to tell me that I'm doing it wrong or whatever and I need to work out all the ways that I can kind of fool the AI into like yes no he's still alive and sentient and knows what he's doing and we don't need to do this intervention just yet that he doesn't want but yeah do you remember I started off by saying that the genome project now mm -hmm. you know that was almost of an unimaginable scale yeah now mapping human psychology is on a different scale altogether so it's and then we've got, as you were hinting at, the ethics and the yeah. regulation. How is that going to all fit together? But I still don't see why we shouldn't open source in the first place to get oh, people starting to experiment. I, and I, and yeah. yeah, I suppose, I suppose partly because I'm like, it's it's the old, um, and maybe it feels like at the moment like software is is learning that that software is politics almost. We always, I mean, not yeah. wanting to, but there's always been that like, oh no, we just we just write code. Like it's other people who do bad things with our code. Um, but at the same time, it's a bit like, well, if you're making guns, people are gonna get killed. 
Um, so you need to be at least happy with the fact that you're making things that, that that's the end result of what they're for, rather than just going, yes, but we only make the guns for the good guys, like not for the bad guys, but the bad guys might get them and like, oh yeah, not really our fault. Um, I, and that's yeah, a bit of a, um, a, a absurdism sort of thing, but it's, it's working out what those, and it's good that we're having these conversations, and so yeah. having more of those sort of talking about the wider impacts of these things, how we maintain this sort of stuff, or what the maintenance, because you know, technology is very good at, this is the new shiny, let's we're not worry about that old bit and go and look at the next thing that we're, what's the next big thing that we're all chasing? And like, and the what are we leaving in our waste? Yeah, yeah, technical debt, but also just the ethical problems and what have you, and like, think, yeah. what's going on behind it. So, this has been a fantastic talk. <laughs> we've, I know we've gone all, all over the place, yes, yeah, so that. <laughs> but before we finish, yep. if anybody wants to get in touch or track what you're doing, mm -hmm. do you have a blog or a Twitter account? I do, I have many places on the internet, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yes, I'm A McEwen on, um, on Twitter, A-M-C-E-W-E-N. Yeah. Um, amq at mastodon.me.uk if you want oh, to go yeah. kind of properly open source and distributed and what have you. Uh, mcqn.com is my is my blog, um, or my website, I suppose, company website and things. Uh, that's probably the easiest place to start from. Uh, well, thank you, Adrian. Yeah, thank you. Great talk.